Hello, America. I'm Mark Levin, and this is Life, Liberty, and Levin. Welcome. I know you can be a thousand different places on Sunday. You can always DVR the program, too, and we have a killer show. I'm glad you're here. Two great guests. James Trusty, former Department of Justice prosecutor, former President Trump lawyer, and Matt Whitaker, former acting United States Attorney General. We've got a lot to discuss. But before we get into the, the weeds on the legal issues, and we will make it interesting, I want to discuss a little bit of history with you. History is lost on prosecutors. It's lost on all these debate shows. It's lost among lawyers who talk about January 6th. Oh, it was an insurrection. No, it wasn't. We've had contentious presidential elections in the past. I mean, really contentious. Some have almost led to civil wars. One did. In 1800, Thomas Jefferson and his chosen vice presidential pick, Aaron Burr, tied for first place. Because back then, the ballots were separate for president and vice president, even though they might run in the same party. And it was 73 to 73 electors due to a communication error among Democratic Republican electors or a Burr-led conspiracy, depending on whom you believe. In other words, Burr was disloyal to Jefferson. Jefferson was really running against Adams at the time, but he only got 65 electoral college votes. For the first of only two times in American history, the election went to the House of Representatives. They had over 30 votes back and forth and back and forth. The House was to choose the next president. Alexander Hamilton had enormous power. He disliked Jefferson immensely, but he hated Aaron Burr. So finally, what happens is Alexander Hamilton, of course, he was the first Treasury Secretary. He turned the tide by lobbying his fellow Federalists to throw their support to Jefferson. A couple years later, the famous duel that took place between Burr and Hamilton, where Burr killed Hamilton and then Burr fled the country. That seems a little more contentious than what took place on January 6th uh, in the last election, but more, there's more here. Let's take a look. 1824, this was a doozy. There were four candidates. They were all, uh, the Federalist Party uh, had dissolved. They were all Democrat Republicans. Then there was Andrew Jackson, you might recall, the hero of the War of 1812. He won the popular vote by fewer than 39,000 votes, captured 99 electoral votes. Secretary of State John Quincy Adams, he took 84 electoral votes, came in second. 41 votes went for William Crawford. He was the Treasury Secretary, and 37 for the House Speaker, Henry Clay. So no candidate earned a majority of the electoral votes. The election again went to the House of Representatives. Clay was eliminated. He was the lowest vote getter. Only three candidates can be considered, but the House still controlled. After a month of back and forth negotiations, it went on and on. Henry Clay supporters threw their weight behind John Quincy Adams, even though he had gotten less votes than Jackson, less electoral college votes than Jackson. So Adams would become president, and he would choose Henry Clay as his secretary of state soon after his inauguration. This enraged Andrew Jackson. He resigns from the Senate. He called it a corrupt bargain. He said the whole election was a fraud, and then he would go back and run again the next time around, and he would defeat Adams. But this almost led, almost led to a civil war. Then 1860, presidential election wasn't just contentious, as is pointed out, it tore the nation apart. Abraham Lincoln got about 39% of the popular vote. He was running against Senator Stephen Douglas, the Democrat from Illinois. They were both from Illinois, actually. Also, Running for president was John Breckinridge, as well as John Bell of Tennessee. Lincoln won, as I said, about 39% of the vote, but took most of the electoral college votes in the North and California and Oregon. Breckinridge won the electoral votes in most of the South, along with Maryland, Delaware. Bell won Tennessee, Kentucky, and Virginia. Douglas captured only Missouri, despite finishing second in the popular vote. You had a real mess. Just weeks after Lincoln's victory, South Carolina voted to secede. Six more southern states followed. 
forming the Confederate States of America in February 1861, and they elected Democrat Jefferson Davis as their president. I would say that was pretty contentious, America, but it also gave us Abraham Lincoln. Here's the biggest, 1876. Democrat Governor Samuel Tilden of New York won 250,000 more votes in the popular vote than Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican. He also got 19 more electoral college votes. But Tilden was still one electoral vote, one, short of the required 185 majority. And 20 votes remained uncounted. In Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina, why? Because their votes were too close to call. Each party accused the other of fraud. And yet in Oregon, one elector was declared illegal and replaced with controversial results. So you had a crisis here, the greatest electoral crisis in American history. And threats of another civil war it was 1876. So what happened here? Congress established a 15-member commission of senators, congressmen, and Supreme Court justices. So they said, you know, we can't figure this out. Let's have a commission. So this is about as far as the, from the popular vote in the electorate as you can get. But keep something in mind. Congress is making all these decisions. Not a Department of Justice, not a prosecutor. In every one of these cases where fraud is alleged, where there's lobbying, where there's pressure on state legislatures and so forth and so on, it's the give and take of politics. And Congress has the final say under the Constitution. Congress and nobody else. So they set up this 15-member commission of senators, congressmen, Supreme Court justices, seven Republicans, seven Democrats, one independent, ultimately to decide the election. After that swing vote turned to Hayes, that one controversial elector, goes to Hayes. Hayes, even though he is 20 electoral college votes behind, even though he got 250,000 less votes than did Tilden. It goes to Hayes. And so what does the commission say? Well, the swing guy went for Hayes. We'll give the other 19 electoral college votes to Hayes. So the commission picks the president, Rutherford B. Hayes, who had the less popular vote, the less electoral college vote, and they threw the 20 electoral college votes remaining to Hayes. And after the Democrats, they said, you know what, we're going to have to put up with this. We're going to filibuster this and block the official vote count that's going to take place. So what did they do after that? Well, they met at a hotel in Washington in February 1877, and they worked out a compromise. The Democrats would accept Hayes' victory, provided that Hayes removed all federal troops from the South. The compromise consolidated Democrat control of the region, the South, effectively ended Reconstruction, reversing the gains that African Americans had made during the post-Civil War era. So the Democrats not only did that, they undermined the efforts that had been undertaken by a Republican president earlier, Ulysses S. Grant, to send the U.S. Army into the South to destroy the Klan. All that changed as a result of the 1876 election. Now, later they'd pass a statute to try and work all these things out. But it's amazing. Nobody was indicted, Mr. Producer. Nobody was charged with anything. It's just incredible. Then we have the election of 2000. Al Gore, George W. Bush, all came down to Florida. A couple hundred votes. Al Gore brings the first lawsuit, and it becomes litigation hell. Different districts throughout the state, forum shopping by both sides, trying to find judges that would uphold this part of the law, that part of the law. Meanwhile, the radical left-wing Democrat-controlled Florida Supreme Court steps in and keeps changing the law, changing the law, changing the law to try and get Gore over the finish line. In the end, the U.S. Supreme Court steps in and says, that's enough. That's enough. Uh, the voting has to stop at some point. The Supreme Court of Florida can't keep changing the rules. They are destroying one person, one vote, the entire concept. And so George Bush winds up being the winner. And he wins the Electoral College by five votes. He also lost the popular vote by over half a million votes. That was a very contentious election, and we all know it. January 6th, this, this past cycle for the president, said to be an insurrection. 
And President Trump was said to be guilty of seditious conspiracy. We had a whole January 6th commission set up by Nancy Pelosi. She picked the Democrats and the Republicans. She rejected the Republicans that Leader McCarthy had chosen. It's never been done before in American history. And they do all this one-sided public stuff, and they turn it over to a prosecutor. Well, the funny thing about the prosecution is, here it is. There is a criminal act, rebellion or insurrection, passed during the Civil War period. It appears nowhere in the, the charges against Donald Trump. Donald Trump is not guilty of rebellion or insurrection. He's not even charged with it. Whoever incites, sets on foot, assists or engages in any rebellion or insurrection against the authority of the U.S. or the laws thereof, or gives aid or comfort thereto, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 10 years or both, and shall be incapable of holding any office under the United States. That's not in here. But what about seditious conspiracy? I remember legal analysts all over cable TV, some here, CNN for sure, MSNBC, New York Times, Washington, but seditious conspiracy, they have Trump dead to rights. But it's not in the charges. If two or more persons in any state or territory in any place subject to the jurisdiction of the United States conspire to overthrow, put down, or to destroy by force the government of the United States, or to levy war against them, or to oppose by force the authority thereof, or by force to prevent, hinder, or delay the execution of any law of the United States, or by force to seize, take, or possess any property of the United States, contrary to the authority thereof, they shall each be fined under this title or in prison not more than 20 years or both. So why? Why didn't this out-of-control rogue, Eric Holder, Obama, Biden, prosecutor, Garland's man, Smith, bring these charges? Because he had no evidence. Rebellion or insurrection? All the testimony of the January 6th committee, all the testimony, all the witnesses, all the documents, not a scintilla of evidence that Donald Trump led any kind of rebellion or insurrection. What about seditious conspiracy? There was no seditious conspiracy. Donald Trump is the man who said, if they want 10,000 armed army soldiers to protect them on January 6th, please let me know. Well, nobody's leading an insurrection if they're offering armed federal troops to protect the Capitol building. And we heard what Donald Trump said about peacefully, peacefully lobbying Congress. So it doesn't work. So what happened? So Jack and the boys go back and they say, you know what, we can't let this go anyway. So they go back to the Civil War, post-Civil War period, a law that was passed in 1871. It was called the Ku Klux Klan Act at the time to try and defeat the Klan. That's one of the counts here. 18 U.S.C. 241, Conspiracy Against Rights. It is a disgusting and preposterous overreach. Then we have two counts under 18 U.S.C. 1512. Now, these laws were passed in 2002 to address gaps that they felt existed in the Enron scandal investigation. These are considered the Enron statutes. Uh, they have nothing to do with January 6 uh, uh, protests. Even though this has been used, so-called obstruction, this has been used against one protester after another by these same prosecutors from January 6th. This has not yet gone to the Supreme Court. It will be tested by the Supreme Court. And I believe the Supreme Court will say, no, this was never intended to be used that way. Then we have count one, 18 U.S.C. 371. Now, that count is a garden variety statute that the federal government uses against federal contractors, people who cheat the government out of money and so forth. Uh, and that has been expanded to include, uh, you know, challenging the legitimate activity of the government. Again, stretched completely out of control. Those are the four charges. This is a disgusting attack on our electoral system. And as I've said before, the electoral system in America is now dead unless all of this is reversed. We cannot have, after all these years, more than two centuries, a Department of Justice and U.S. attorneys with 2020 hindsight delving into what a president or a candidate thinks. Now, that 1876 election, I told you that that state sent in two groups of electors. You're free to do that. Congress 
decides all this stuff. They're not criminal activities. So, but now, what are the rules for running, challenging, and disputing elections today? We don't know. Who decides? Apparently prosecutors. What can a candidate or when can a candidate rely on legal advice since President Trump's lawyers are being indicted for giving legal advice? Is a president not free to discuss decisions about elections with his vice president and strongly urge him to take one position or another? Of course he's free to do that. Is a president free to publicly dispute election results? They all do when they lose, including people like Hillary Clinton and Al Gore. The electoral process is now not purely political and constitutional as it was intended, but now it is the control of prosecutors, Department of Justice, and in the hands of these people, in the Biden administration, it is a disaster. And the judge who's going to hear this case is the most radical, partisan, activist, Obama appointee in the entire federal judiciary. Gee, I wonder how she got chosen. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.